Good morning. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning. If you want to come on in, find us by. We're going to worship with us.
be with you and forgive all our sins that we committed, Lord. Pray that you speak to your Pastor Travis today as he preaches this morning and you would touch those who not only are struggling, but those who just need some sort of encouragement. We pray this and we thank you. In Jesus' name. See in front of you in, in uh, those pockets there, there's a connection card. It's also for prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests you want to fill out, let us know. We have a prayer service on Wednesday nights. We gather and we pray for those requests. Uh, so you can just drop those in the offering plates as the ushers make their way forward to get ready to take offering. Um, you can also just drop them in the offering boxes in the back. We have several ways you can give uh, here at the church. We want to try to be as convenient as possible to help you uh, just be able to worship the Lord through giving to Him. Uh, the plates, the boxes in the back, online, thelakeschurch.tv slash give. Uh, we have a little iPad there at the back, the sound booth, that you can just use your debit card. Don't use your credit card. We teach responsible giving, not giving what you don't have. But uh, you can use your debit card there. So uh, Anyway, just wanted to make you aware of just a couple of those things. Uh, keep in mind, uh, the Castleman's be praying for Josh. Uh, I talked with him this morning. Uh, he is, uh, well, I, I conversed with him, text message, but, um, <clears throat> but he's, uh, he's in El Paso now, they're, they're training pretty hard, uh, 18 hour days, aren't you glad you're not in the military, <laughs> uh, but then they're going to be deployed and, and going, so you just keep uh, Josh and Ed Moore in your prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray for our offering, and then we'll go ahead and take that. Father, thank you uh, that we get to worship you through giving back just a little bit of what you've given to us. Lord, may you take these gifts and use them for your glory. Father, it's, it's uh, just so comforting to know that everything we have comes from you. And so you are already meeting our needs before we even know what they are. And so, Lord, uh, we thank you for just a small way in which we can acknowledge that what we have comes from you. Uh, we just ask that you would keep your hand on Josh uh, this morning as he gets ready to uh, train and get the right mindset for his deployment coming up. Pray for Dora, who will be here. And uh, Lord, uh, we just thank you that you're in control of all things. Use these gifts now for your glory. So just name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus took bread, 
And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. We've come to learn that what he's saying is, this is not literally my flesh. Christians aren't cannibals. What he's saying is, every time you gather to partake of this, every time you fill the, whether it's the eleven bread or in our case the little wafers, every time your teeth crunch that, remember that Christ's body was broken for our sins. That's what he's saying when he gives it to you. Remember, this is my body broken for you, taking your place to fulfill your sins since you couldn't do it on your own. And he took a cup, verse 27, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And here he's again telling us, this, you're not literally drinking my blood. Christians are vampires. What he's saying is this is symbolic. You know, grape juice? It works a little more effectively with wine than we do grape juice. Uh, but you know, the, 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 the fruit of juice, that, that, uh, the juice of grapes, has that sweet taste to it. And then it has a slightly, slightly bitter aftertaste. I think it's intentional here. To remind us of the sweetness of forgiveness. But the bitterness that it cost Christ for. And that it was us. We like to point the fingers at everybody else who does wrong, but if, if I was the only person on earth, he still would have died. And it would have been my sin that put him. Because it was my sin that put him. He goes on to say, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. That's pointing to Revelation 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb, to let us know as often as we keep taking this, we're remembering the Lord's Supper is still ongoing until we get to heaven and get to partake of that with Him. Think of all the different Lord's Suppers you've heard explained over the years, officiated by different elders and pastors, and understand it. That the best is yet to come, because the last one's ever going to be taken, Jesus will officially. That would be better than that. With that in mind, I'd like to invite uh, the deacons who are going to help hand out. You don't have to be a member of the Lakes Church to partake. All we ask is that you have professed faith in Christ. And we're not going to judge. That's between you and the Lord. We would ask that you take this moment as, as we, we will pray and then we'll pass out both uh, the, the wafer and then we'll come back and we'll pass out the, the cup. Um, as, we as we pass that out, uh, wow, that got dark. <laughs> uh, just take some time to reflect. Get right with the Lord, confess any sins to Him. Uh, and you can partake of it. We have the house lights up just a little. We'll get there. There we go. All right. Let me, let me pray for it. Father, thank you for your shed blood. Thank you that your body was broken for us. Thank you for what that means. Thank you that Jesus took our place. Help us to never forget what that is. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.
broken the bread, he said, take, eat, for this is my body broken. The text says he took the cup and offered thanks. Let us likewise offer thanks for the Lord's blood. Father, thank you for the new covenant we have that is sealed in the shed blood of Jesus. Thank you for what that means for us. Thank you that means that all of our sins have been paid once and for all, past, present, and future. Lord, help us to live a life worthy of being covered by those, by that blood. Thank you for what that means. Thank you that we have hope. Thank you that we have forgiveness. It's in Jesus' name. Thank you. 
house in the morning. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we do thank you that we get to gather, that we get to fellowship with one another, that we can call you Father. We don't have to just call you Master. Though that would certainly be an honor. We can call you Father. We can call you friend. We can even call you Dad. And that that's possible because of what Jesus did for us. And that all we have to do is admit that we're less than perfect. We know that means we're evil, we're full of sin, and we ask you to forgive us of that. To make us pure, perfect in your eyes. But you will do that because Jesus' blood covers all of our sins. We just ask you that, that you promise you will forgive our sins and that you will add us to your faith. Thank you for that. We ask now that the Spirit would just guide us, remove any distractions that may keep us from hearing what it is you want us to hear this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, we're back in 1 Corinthians. And we took a couple weeks off to uh, celebrate Easter and what that means. <clears throat> and uh, some of you are like, oh, good, we're back in 1 Corinthians. <laughs> You looked at the title and you said, man, when are we going to get past all this sex talk? <laughs> I understand. We'll get there, though. That's the one thing about preaching through a book. We don't avoid hard topics. That's what's great about going verse by verse. Is if they show up, we're going to deal with it. Uh, but for those of you who may be busy, you may have uh, your children with you and say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready for them to hear the birds and the bees. Uh, we're going to keep this PG. We might flirt with PG-13 a little bit, but we're going to try to keep it, you know, how it should be, but if you would prefer to give your children not hear that, they're welcome down in, in the, the kids' section, uh, in the factory, our workers will take them there, so I just want y'all to be aware of that, so, uh, now we've gotten that out of the way. <laughs> you know, I remember when I started off college, uh, I graduated from Texas Tech, but I started college at Howard Payne. And uh, when I was there, I was there for three semesters, it's a Christian university, uh, I ended it kind of naive. I grew up in a, in a very good Christian home. We were in church just about every time the doors were open. Um, I went to a Christian school. So uh, I kind of lived the Christian bubble, if you will. Now, I, I, you know, I had a job outside of the church, so I got to be exposed a little bit to the world. But I pretty much thought if I was going to a Christian university, people were going to act like Christians. Why would we, you know, flirt with sins of the flesh? Oh, how naive I was. <clears throat> so, uh, if you're a parent and you're concerned to send your child on to a Christian university, please don't take that same naivety. It's just as bad at the Christian universities, too. There's always bad apples there, and we need to be aware of what we're going to face. But I had a friend who uh, was one of those who had changed during the course of time. I was a freshman, he was a senior. We both played the soccer team. And uh, I remember him telling me one time, he said, you know, I grew up in a Christian household, but uh, we basically just heard a whole bunch of, hey, as long as I uh, you know, just ask Jesus to forgive me, he'll forgive me. All we heard was grace. And grace is important, but that's all we heard was grace. Said so when uh, I started flirting around with some girls who wanted to do things that <clears throat> were sins of the flesh, shall we say? I said, uh, I, my thought was, you know what? I really want to do this right now, and God will forgive me for it. He told me it was only later that I realized that uh, <clears throat> this girl who kept leaving me to do this, it's an older lady that I worked with, when I was 17. She was older than me, and I thought that she was married. He said, uh, of course, by then, I had already become addicted to sex, and it took me a while to get over that. And, you know, I, I, I weep for people like that, because I, I know maybe, maybe you are that way, maybe you were that way at one time, of we're so easily justified actions, because we say, you know what? God will forgive me for it. It's not a big deal. And, you know, hey, listen. Even if it is, let's not kid ourselves. We're, God's a spiritual being. Our souls will live on, but our bodies are going to die, right? So, I mean, does it really matter how I treat my body? 
That's a question that the Corinthian church was dealing with. And it's a question that Paul answers in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. That line of thinking is not new. It's something we call Gnosticism, where they say the body is bad but the spirit's good. One of my senior professors had another term for it. He called it caveman theology. Body bad, spirit good. <laughs> we need some laughing this morning, so there you are. <laughs> As we think about this, and we know that we want to enjoy our freedom, that Christ has set us free from sin, but uh, we don't want to bring shame to the body of Christ, and we struggle with this, wait a second, does the body matter? We find ourselves asking that very question, don't we? We find ourselves asking this question, since we are spiritual beings, does what I do with my physical body matter? That's uh, the big question up there. Does what I do with my physical body matter? We're going to see that Paul's going to address three truths about the body. And then we'll answer this question with an application question. As we look at our text in 1 Corinthians 6 this morning. Three truths about the body. And then we'll uh, answer our question. Would you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 12, and we will read through the rest of the chapter. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Follow along in whichever translation you've brought with you. Or whatever you have on your phone. Or you can follow them on the screen. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. All things are lawful for me. But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. But I will be dominated by... I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. This is the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. Remember, we're looking at three truths about the body. If you're a note taker, you can follow along in the uh, outline I've included there in your bulletins. If not, don't worry about it. The first truth I want to see this morning is that the body was not made for sex. I know that's going to be shocking to some of us, but that's not why God made us. Our bodies are not made for sex. You say, well, no, Pastor, I've got sexual organs. Yes, but that's not why your body exists. See, this is what the Corinthians were arguing. My body was made for sex. Look at how they start off this slogan. And, and, and understand that where we always get in trouble as Christians and, and, and sin is when we start justification. God's justification is what we want. See, God justifies us, declares us righteous. When we look at actions and declare that what is bad is good, we, we get in trouble. And I always say, the best way to know if you're flirting with that one is if you start sounding like Satan in the Garden of Eden. Well, is that really what it is? Uh, is that really what God wants of me here? When we start justifying like that, we get in trouble. Now, we're going to look at a couple of slogans from the Corinthians this morning. First thing I need us to see is they were taking God's forgiveness and justifying that, saying, God has set me free. Just like my friend uh, at, at college told me, he's like, I, I knew it was wrong in the moment, but in my head I was like, well, I really want to do this. And you know what? God's going to forgive me anyway. He said, so I justified it. I was okay with it, right? Because God's going to forgive me anyway. So the first thing I want to see about God's forgiveness is that forgiveness of sin does not mean freedom to sin. 
We're not 00 Christian. I said this a couple weeks ago, but it was worth repeating. Y'all know James Bond, 007, License to Kill? When you are given freedom, you don't become 00 Christian, licensed to sin. Because I'm free from sin, right? So it doesn't matter. Sin has no rule over me. So if I want to sin, I can sin. I've got freedom. That's not what it means. But let's take a look at how the Corinthians got there. You'll notice in, in uh, your verse, uh, your, your uh, verses 12 and 13, your, your, your Bible's there, depending on which translation you have, they may have quotations on it. What is happening here is that Paul is quoting slogans or mottos, if you will. Sorry, uh, I just started laughing in my head. Every time I hear motto, I hear, what's a motto? Nothing. What's a motto with you? Uh, <laughs> I've been awake since 3 morning. Give me a little slack here. <laughs> forgiveness of sin does not mean freedom to sin. See, this was a slogan that the Corinthians were coming up with. Not that up there, but what is quoted in verse 12. All things are lawful for me. I, I want to restate these verses with this. Look at it this way. Here's your motto. All things are lawful for me. Now, how did the Corinthians get there? Go to the next slide, because we're going to show you. They would have been familiar with Galatians. Galatians was the first book of the Bible. Well, maybe second book of the Bible. First of Paul's epistles written. It was in about AD 48. He's writing this in the early 60s. So the Corinthians are, are, are familiar with Galatians. It would have uh, started getting reproduced all around the churches. And they would have been familiar with chapter 5, verse 1. It's for freedom. Christ has set us free. And everyone says, Amen. That's, that's, that's great, brother. And then they say, and, and, and even further on in that same chapter, Paul, next slide, we see that for you are called to freedom, brothers. And they say, Amen. Man, that's good stuff. That means I can do whatever I want, right? Go back to that slide there. Because we see that's how they built this model. Hey, all things are lawful for me. Now look at Paul's first rebuttal. Uh, but, but, but not all things are helpful. So see, the Corinthians were doing what we are so guilty of doing ourselves. Not taking all of Scripture. Just taking enough of Scripture to slap onto our earthly motto and pass those on the back and make it sound like it's coming from God. Go back to, uh, do that next slide there, and let's look at, see, this is what they were saying. For you were called to freedom, brothers. And Paul says, that's interesting because I think there was more to that verse. Let's put the rest of the verse there. Only do not use your freedom <laughs> As an opportunity for the flesh. Hang on a second. What, what did he say there? What did God say through Paul? You're called to freedom. Amen. Thank you, Lord. But don't use your freedom to sin. Huh. You see, we're so good at doing that. Memorize part of a verse. And it becomes our motto. That's why we preach verse by verse at this church. No matter who's going to be in the pulpit, we go through scripture. Why? So that we don't take this out of context and create false doctrine with scriptural mottos. That's not what we're going to do. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Okay. So we're on to something here. Keep going on because there's a second replay. You'll notice twice he quotes, all things are awful for me. I will not be dominated by anything. I love, I love that translation. Someone say, I will not be enslaved by anything. I love dominating. Because, you see, Paul has to do this again. Go back to Galatians 5 1. He says, Hey, you remember y'all said it's for freedom, Christ sets free? Again, you just grab the first part of that because the rest of it says, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't be dominated by sin. You've been set free from it. I, I, what? Logic doesn't make to walk into a jail cell, tell somebody who's wrongfully in prison, hey, we're opening the doors and you're free to go. And he just stands and says, nah, it's cool. I'm good where I'm at. Don't worry about it. I mean, you can leave the door open if you want. I might step out and throw my free right now and then, but I, I like where I'm at. I'm going to voluntarily just stay here. <laughs> That's what Paul's saying. See, we, we, can't, we can't see that shoulder thing in Scripture. That's, that's what he's doing. It's like, what are you doing? I will not be dominated by anything. You use your freedom to sin 
And before you know it, you're going to become addicted to your sin. And now, what you were once set free from has become a master over you again. And you're dominated by it. So, that's the first thing we see here. Is he says, uh, forgiveness of sin does not mean freedom to sin. Now look what it does mean. Forgiveness of sin does mean freedom from sin. Freedom from sin. Sin no longer has control over me. I no longer have to sin. Let's keep going on and look at this because again, he quotes some more. Here's your model. Look at verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Now, there's some debate as to whether, where the quotation marks should go amongst Bible translators. Whether it should go here, like we have it in the English Standard Version, after food, or whether it should go like uh, the, new, uh, the New English Translation, uh, the NIV, they put it at the end of other. It doesn't matter where the quotation stops. What is to be understood here is that this is the whole model. Let me tell you what I mean by that. If I were to say, let's eat, drink, and be merry. <clears throat> And I stop. And you want to rebuke that wrong philosophy, you might say, you know, there's more to life than simply food and, and fine drinks and having a good time. Or you might decide to begin your rebuke first by finishing the slogan. So I'll say, hey, let's just eat, drink, and marry. And you, as I say, for tomorrow we may die. But, and then go on and give me the review. That's, what, that's what's happening here, is we're having the rest of the quotation filled in. This was a uh, motto. Food's for the stomach and stomach's for the food, and God will destroy both one and the other. Now, what they've done is they've Christianized this, because this was a, a secular Greek motto in which they used for their, can we say, decadent parties. You know what I mean if I, I use that term? Parties that justify really bad stuff going on. The Greeks would use this term a lot in the first century. Food's for the stomach, stomach's for the food, and it doesn't matter, the body's going to be destroyed anyway. Now, they have, the Corinthians have Christianized this by saying, and God will destroy both one and the other. See, it doesn't matter what I do with the body. And, and, and before we poke fun at them, realize that this type of thinking, what we call Gnosticism, that it's all about the spirit and the body doesn't matter, it, it's crept into a lot of uh, our thinking as Christians today. We talk so much about the spiritual and forget that the body matters too. We're going to go on and see how exactly the body matters. Let's look at the rebuttal to this. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God has raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. That's kind of hard to see. I agree. Let's break this down. Let's put a part of the slogan up there. It's the next slide. The motto, food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. And the rebuttal that is, but the body is not meant for sexual morality. You say, man, I'm having a hard time getting there. I thought we were talking about food. Notice this is a uh, euphemism. Now, think through this with me. If you were to replace the word food and stomach with sex and sex organs, go to the next slide, let's see what that says. Hey, sex is meant for the body and you know, the sex organs, the sex organs for sex. That's, I, I, just, I have them, I'm supposed to make use of them and just have sex, that's what we do. That's what they're saying when they say, food's for the stomach and stomach for the food. Hey, I'm a sexual being, I'm just supposed to have sex. That's what I do. Which is why, remember the Holy Spirit's inspiring Paul to write these words. You're not fooling God. God says, all right, I'll play your game, but I'm not going to talk about the metaphorical food. I'm going to name what you're actually describing. So the rebuttal here is, the body's not meant for sex. It's not meant for sexual morality. It's meant for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. We're going to explore that a little bit more, so stick with me. Next part of the model. They say, besides, God's going to destroy the body anyway, so it doesn't matter. You can almost hear justification like, hey, you, you, you guys that give those absence talks and, and try to scare us with, well, I might get several STDs and so maybe I, I, I might die at 45 from these things. Well, it doesn't matter anyway. Actually, that's probably a better thing because I'll get to heaven sooner. You see how corrupt that thinking has become? <coughs> that's what they're saying. Notice what Paul says. 
And God, who raised Jesus from the dead, remember? He raised from the dead. He had a physical body. He said, put your hands here and see the nail holes. Put your hand here and see the side. But it was a perfect body. It had the scars from his life on earth and a body that was dying, but it had been raised from the dead and regenerated. Everybody still saw Jesus, but that body was no longer capable of sin. Now, Jesus never sinned, but he was born into a body that was capable of sin. Otherwise, he could never defeat sin. You understand that? And notice, Paul doesn't stop there. He says, and God will also raise us up by his power. What's he saying? Your body matters. One day, you're going to be reunited, soul and body, when you're raised to new life. So don't think the body doesn't matter. That's the first point we have. The body was not made for sex. Second point, the body is an extension of Christ. Look at how he develops this. The body is an extension of Christ. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That's letter A. The Christian's body is joined to the body of Christ. Now we know the metaphorical body, we call that the church. But he says, you're joined to the body of Christ. If you are a Christian, you call yourself part of the body of Christ. Do you understand this concept? Now, I love what he's going to do here. Because in the rest of verse 15, and then 16 and 17, he's going to make a statement in 15. And then you're going to have to work your way backwards from 17 and 16 to understand the statement in 15. So let's go on to letter B. And see, the truth is presented here, is that sex is the joining of two into one. But that's both body and spirit. We don't think about that, do we? Did you know that science has actually proven this? I love it when that happens. A scriptural truth proven by science that tries to disprove God. Y'all know, many of you know, I used to do abstinence talks all the time. Well, here's what we found out. Doctors, medical people, they, 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 they study human brains and everything that happens. When you willfully engage in sexual intercourse with somebody else, there are chemicals released. They're called different things depending you know, on if you're male or female, but it bonds you to that person. And they say it bonds you in an emotional, a uh, sensual or spiritual way. Your souls are knit to one another. So you're saying that this is more than just two bodies becoming one, but my soul is knit to a, another person's soul. My wife told me when she was uh, in college, there's a preacher who used to talk about this a lot, the church she went to, and he's, he explained it this way. Every time you engage in intercourse with a different person, you're giving a part of your soul to that person. So if you were to have 10 different sexual partners, You've divided your soul ten ways. Huh. Interesting. You know, the world's not totally um, clueless to this concept. Last week at, at Easter, I, I mentioned several different uh, stories that we can see and how sometimes you can see God's truth come out and just man, whether they're believers or not, just the stories they write. I, I talked about Harry Potter. If you're all familiar with the, that storyline, uh, J, uh, J.K. Rowling, she presents the, the, the evil person, Voldemort. He was once described as a really nice, good-looking man, but he became so obsessed with uh, an act that would rip the soul apart, which was murder, that every time he committed murder, he would take a part of his soul and store it in some thing, because he thought that would make him immortal. So by the time you meet him so many years later, he doesn't even look like a man. He looks like a snake in, in human form. And they describe this as the fact that his soul is missing. Now again, that's all just story made up. But the point is what? We understand this concept that doing things that, that would just rip apart the soul as possible makes you look just not right. It, it, there's, there's something wrong about you. Now I have good news for those of you who say, Pastor, I, I, what about me? I've, I never willfully engaged in sex, but somebody forced it on me. See, God protects you. Because those chemicals aren't released. When your body says, this is not what I want, I wish it would stop, it shuts down that bonding on an emotional, mental, and spiritual level. 
Which is why I've been able to counsel people who come to me in, in a week and say, I didn't want to lose my virginity, but somebody took it from me. I say, no, they didn't. And I explain this whole concept. I say, they may have forced themselves on you physically. I'm not, I'm not downplaying that. But see, God kept you from being connected to them on an emotional, spiritual level. So that you can still save that part of you for when you get married one day. And understand the first time you willfully engage in that, now you have bonded yourself completely to that person that you chose to bond yourself to. God has still saved your virginity. I love telling people that. It's just so great to see that almost like tears coming out. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize God was taking care of me. He's going to explore this concept. Stick with me. What's that next slide? Verse 16. He says, Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. This is a concept not lost on humanity at large. I remember I saw when I was growing up in the 90s <clears throat> that was talking about sex. And one of the lines in it says, Tonight's the night when two become one. We understand that concept, right? Sex means that there's two separate bodies that have now become one body. Keep going on. And let's look at what he says in verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. See, what he's saying here is when you have surrendered yourself to Jesus and said, Forgive me of my sins, I am yours. And he puts his Holy Spirit within you. It is bonded to you on a spiritual level. And now what he's saying is you're connected to the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now stick with me here. Because look at the logic he's trying to present. If you are bonded with the body of Christ spiritually, and then you take a portion of that body yourself, and in the physical world, join yourself to somebody else physically, you've now taken the spiritual union of Christ and joined it to somebody on a spiritual realm and physically that wasn't supposed to be joined. See what he's doing? It's like taking your finger and trying to join it with something else. It's a member of your body, and you're trying to join it into something else that's not supposed to, you're going to get hurt. I try to join my finger with electrical current, bad things are going to happen. Keep going on. Because we're going to turn to other Pauline epistles. This is from Ephesians. Now, next week we're going to talk about marriage, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring this out a little bit more. First Corinthians chapter 7, he starts dealing with uh, slightly, well, I can't say uh, non-heavy topics, but switches away from talking about sex so much. First Corinthians 7. But let's get a preview of that, because in Ephesians 5, where we often go to talk about the relationship of husbands and wives, he just talked about how in verses 27 and 28 of Ephesians 5, that uh, the husband is to care for and nurture his wife. And he goes on, verse 29, he's playing why. He says, For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Keep going on. Because it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is the same quotation we see here. And he's quoting this from Genesis 2, when God brings Adam and Eve together and says, here you are two separate entities, but I've made you in my image. Remember Genesis 1, God says, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. That means your body too is a reflection of who God is. And he says, and then the two will leave their parents one day and be joined together, and the two will become one flesh. Just like how God is three separate individuals and yet one person. Got a similar concept here. Now go on, because look what Paul ends with here in verse 32. I love this. This mystery is profound that two could become one. But I'm not talking about a man and his wife having sex. I'm referring that it refers to Christ and the church. What he's saying here is just like Christ represents the head of the church, when Christ and the church come together spiritually, emotionally, it looks sort of like what we look like in our Christian marriages is a man and wife having one name be one in purpose. Yes, they are one in body when they engage in sexual intercourse, but that's why when they take on the, the name of the man, you become one new family unit, right? 
And in Christian marriage, the role of husbands and wives is to reflect the role of Christ in the church. So what we see here is the same concept. Keep moving on. We go back to verse 15 now. Paul says, okay, now that you understand this, and you know that your bodies are members of Christ, shall I then take the members of Christ and make the members of a prostitute? What he's saying is, hey, if Christ was actually here next to you in the flesh, would you say, hey, let's go and walk into this problem, Jesus? Well, you know what the answer would be? You're embarrassed that you would even suggest the answer would be yes, right? You notice the word of gold there says never. In the Greek, it's make or non I, I just butchered that, but that's okay. The phrase is basically the strongest form of no capable in Scripture. I can't share the strongest form of no capable in our English language equivalent because usually it's a swear word followed by no. But you get the idea, right? When somebody says that phrase, you know they mean emphatically no, and I'm insulted that you would even suggest that there's a hint of yes. That's exactly what Paul's saying. He's not swearing at them. He's saying, this is such a, a preposterous concept. Why would you even suggest it could be yes? So he says, sex is the joining of two into one, both body and spirit. And we need to understand that because if we actually understand that we're joining both body and spirit, then we understand that we're linked to Christ spiritually and we would never take the body of Christ and subject it to immoral sexual behavior. And that's what he ends on verse 18a in this section here. How we treat our bodies, I'm sorry, don't fight sexual temptation. That's letter C. You say, well, hang on a second, Pastor. I thought we were supposed to fight. Every other form of sinful temptation, we are supposed to fight. But he says, when it comes to sexual temptation, you don't fight it. You got that, that motto, fight or flight? Choose the second one. Flight. Flee it. That's what that word means, flee. Run away. Those of you who like Disney movies, think of the Lion King and Scar talking to Mufasa. Run. Run away and never return. When you are walking up to sexual immorality, let's, let's talk through this a little bit. Go to that next slide, I'll show you how you can conquer internet sexual immorality. Sexual immorality in the Greek is pornea. We get our word pornography from that. Covenant eyes, that's something I use. In my opinion, I think every Christian ought to use it. I was supposed to have flyers to give to you today, and somehow they got delayed. They sent me a notification this week. I was like, of course they got delayed. We will have them, though. We ordered, uh, I think, almost 200 of these flyers. So you'll have plenty. We'll hand them out hopefully next week. So you can, you can have something in your hand and say, okay, what do I use? Let me tell you why I like this program so much. It goes on every computing device I own. Phone, computer, tablet, and here's what it does. It acts almost like a, a, a virus in a way. It forbids you from using the internet unless it is active and signed in. Now you can make that easy by just saying, always stay signed in, don't ask me, and then it just runs in the background. And what it does is it keeps a log of everywhere you go and stores it on their servers and somebody else gets a daily report of where you have visited. And there's no way you can hack it and undo it. That's why I love it so much. I used to be an IT pro, I know. We, we used to use these accountability things, we're like, hey, maybe I can kind of cheat the system and hide this, right? No, it's real time, it's live, and there's something you can do to change it. You know what's great about that? It's now somebody else in the body of Christ is holding me accountable. It's also, if somebody tries to accuse you of doing something you weren't supposed to, you can say, this is on every device I have. You're free to check my logs. See, it's a safeguard for place. Now, for those of us who really struggle, it also has filtering software built in. That's why I love it so much. And there are so many ways we can flee sexual morality. You say, what if the problem is my mind? Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to this world. Just give up. Say, well, I, my mind is the problem. I guess I'm just going to uh, surrender. It says, be transformed. How do you do that? Well, you've got to run away from that instant. If you need to change what your mind's thinking of, start singing worship songs to God. It's hard to think about sexual reality when you're praising God. Start praying for the individual that's seeking into your mind that you're fantasizing about. It's hard to think about them in a sexually immoral manner when you're praying for them. 
You say, Pastor, my problem is that my girlfriend and I, we, we start kissing and then one thing leads to another. Then stop it and never be alone in the house with someone else. I'm serious. Sometimes we've had to make those rules when we're dating. You know what? We're not even going to have a hint of this. You're in the moment and you're feeling it. Get in the car and drive somewhere where there are people. Go to the coffee shop. You're watching a movie and all of a sudden something comes on. Don't change the channel. Turn the TV off and walk into another room. Flee. Don't try to fight. It. That's the point. Let's move on. We'll press for time so we can go. We've seen that the body was not made for sex. We've seen that the body is an extension of Christ. Finally, the body belongs to God. This is hashed out in verses 18b through 20. I want you to see a concept. That's presented in verse 18. The rest of 18 says, please sexual morality says, every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It says, you're destroying your own body without realizing that your body is going to be renewed. Verse 8 says, sexual sin equals self-destruction. That's what we're really seeing here. Sexual sin equals self-mutilation, self-destruction. I'm destroying my body because I don't think it matters. And I don't realize that it actually does matter. Go on to that next slide. We've got some verses we want to show you. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 53. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And see right now, these people say, Amen. See, that's why it doesn't matter to do with the body. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So what do we got to do? Keep going on. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. It means we not, our bodies will not all lie dead. But we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, verse 53. 52, sorry, keep going. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. What was once perishable will be raised and changed to imperishable. And we who are still alive shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality, just like happened to Jesus when he rose from the grave. And now we understand the body matters to God, and it should matter to us. Sexual sin equals self-destruction. Letter B, the Christian's body is a house of God. That's a weird concept. Look at what he says in verse 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. They say, just like in the Old Testament, when there was a portion of the temple that was called the Holy of Holies, and that's where the Holy Spirit dwelt. Now the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You understand that you house the Holy Spirit within you. That's weird. Now, don't take that too far and say, oh, well, I, I should worship my body. No. But understand that how you treat your body is an act of worship to God. See, how we treat our bodies is an act of worship to God. It says, glorify God in your body. You ever thought about that? Because I'll tell you, the older I get, the less in shape I get, and I stand in front of the mirror, I'm like, well, there's not much glorifying going on here. Maybe it's because I think the body doesn't matter. If we understand that we reflect the image of God, we were made in His image, each one of us individually. And with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, He can literally show up at any time and reveal Himself to people. If we understand that truth, then how we treat our bodies is an act of worship to God in Let's move on. Let's ask that question, so what? Your body matters to God because it's a reflection of God. Your body matters to God because it's a reflection of God. My body matters to God because it's a reflection to the world. I say I represent God. I bear His image. God wouldn't join Himself to sexually immoral behavior, and neither will I. Six questions, and we're through. First, do I know that my body bears the image of God? I really need to struggle through and ask that question. Or is it just a, a philosophical question that I'm like, well, you know, sometimes scripture isn't really true because that's how we think. No, it is true. It says we're made in the image of God. Genesis 1. Do I know that my body bears the image of God? Number two, 
Do I treat my body like it matters to me? Do I treat it like it matters to God? Or say, eh, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> I'm going to have a new body one day, and then I'll look good. Well, you notice, the self-discipline of how I treat myself is a reflection of what I think about God. If I understand that God lives here, then I need to present it. I'm not saying I have to look like a body owner, but I need to at least take care of my body. And I need to make sure that I don't join it to anything immoral. Number three. Am I trying to justify what I know is wrong? I hate that question. Because I know that it's convicted me far too often. But you know what? That's why I love that question. Because the Holy Spirit chooses to convict me. Number four. Do I try to fight off sexual temptation? Normally we'd say, hey man, that's a good thing. But what did we just learn here? Don't try to stand and fight. It's the only time scripture says, don't fight this sin. Every other sin says, stand your ground. You've got God's honor. Sexual temptation is so damaging, it says, turn and run. Not just run, flee. That means jump in the car and push the RPMs to the limit. Get out of there. Because that's number five. Do I run away from sexual temptation? Or do I think I'm being spiritual by standing there and fighting it? <laughs> Listen, if you're a recovering alcoholic, I don't tell you, go stand in the liquor aisle for an hour and say no. I say, don't even go to the liquor aisle. Avoid it. Run away from it. It's not spiritual to stand and look at the covers of triple X movies and say, huh? I'm going to practice just how strong I am with God right now by saying no to this. You run away from them. You don't even take the plot. Last one. Is my sex life an act of worship to God? Have you ever thought about that? If you're in a Christian marriage and God says sex is good, I designed it that way. Between one man and one woman for a lifetime. Then it's an act of worship. If I'm Engaging in sexual intercourse in any form that's not me and my spouse <coughs> in Christian marriage is an act of rebellion to God. Interesting concept to think about. Thank you for the extra time. Let me invite the worship team up as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for some hard truth that we need to learn. We don't like talking about sexual sin because we place so much of our identity in how we treat our bodies. But Lord, our identity, if we've asked you to forgive us, is that the Holy Spirit lives here. I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm a child of God. And you tell us that you want our bodies for good, to glorify you, to show to the world what the original intent was. Help us to do that. Help us to honor you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The invitation will be brief this morning, but we want to give you time. Now, if you come forward, we'll keep playing. We'll ask everybody to stand. We're going to just uh, reprise that Come As You Are song. If you need prayer, come on down to the front. No one's going to judge you as soon as you come down for sexual sin. You may just say, man, this is the kind of church I want to join. I want to come on down and talk to them. Or you may say, I don't know this Jesus. I need to ask for forgiveness and ask him to become Lord of my life. You may say, I, I need to pray with somebody. We're here. Come on down now. I want to invite you to just come and do business with the Lord as we play through the song.
we'd love to talk with you. Um, just about anything the floor is like on your heart this morning. I'm going to be in the back, uh, kind of where you walk out called Connection Center. I'd love to meet you and talk with you. We can talk about stuff other than sex, <laughs> just so you know. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad to see you all here this morning. Uh, Y'all remember uh, just that? That's a good week. Glorify God. It's just how you treat each other. Let's end on a good note. Not that scripture isn't good. Sometimes we need to enlighten our people a little bit. Let's worship God. Take us on out, please.